speak with you this morning about the domestication of God, or at least the attempt to domesticate God, or the thought that we do. Uh, The church of the 21st century has minimalized God. It doesn't take God quite as seriously as believers in the early church took God. We have a way of domesticating God by bringing him under our control by placing him in our box, by causing him to be the kind of God that we want him to be rather than searching the scriptures and discovering the kind of God that he is. Many of of you have heard of C.S. Lewis. You've read or have seen the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in that movie, Jesus is represented by a lion. Aslan. It's a beautiful book. I I encourage you to read the book maybe even more than see the movie. Uh, But there's a similarity that I want to bring out between Aslan the lion and the one true and living God. Part of it can be found in a conversation between Mr. Beaver and Susan. Mr. Beaver is called Mr. Beaver because he's a beaver in 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 the story. And they have a discussion about Aslan the lion. This is the way it goes. Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion, Mr. Beaver says. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he ain't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Well, he's talking about Aslan the lion representing Jesus and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. But I want to tell you that what's true of Aslan and Jesus in that uh, particular story is Equally true about God the Father. We serve a triune God. And we, if we're not careful, we treat God rather casually. We treat Him lightly. Uh, we treat Him as if we, if we can control Him in some way. Uh, my son John has a very big dog. And if you were just to come across his dog Roscoe running around, you would be taken aback. Uh, You'd be a little bit frightened from him initially. John's domesticated Roscoe. This big, burly animal acts more like a puppy than a ferocious, uh, ferocious dog. Uh, Jay Lynn will often go over to John's home, or regularly will go over to John's home. She'll do some painting, hang up some blind, buy him some curtains, put them up for him while he's at work. And I'll ask her, you know, you haven't seen Roscoe in a little while. How, how, what do you, Roscoe's just fine. She walks through that door and Roscoe's jumping around like a, like a puppy, but it's a huge, giant uh, puppy. I say, honey, do you lock the door when you go in? She said, I, I have absolutely zero fear. If anybody walks through that door with me and Roscoe there, Roscoe will tear that person to shreds. I believe it to be true. Uh, we have domesticated God like my son has domesticated Roscoe. He's not very terrifying. He's not very fearful. Well, you might wonder, should we be afraid of God? Well, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, the fear of God. We don't fear God like a parent who abuses a child or a child fears an abusive parent. But to fear God is to have reverence for God, is to respect God. It's to treat God in a way that is commensurate with who He is. The one true and living God who sits on heaven's throne. And in the Bible, whenever people encounter God, they usually fall on their face. Sometimes they'll see themselves for who they really are apart from God. I'm a a sinful man, depart from me, O Lord. That's what Peter said to Jesus in a fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee. 
In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6 said, I am, a, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And then God cleansed his lips. The word glory in the Bible is closely related to the word for heavy. When you talk about the glory of God, you're talking about the heaviness of God rather than God being lightweight, being inconsequential, being insignificant. Uh, we like our gods to be light, fluffy, airy. Uh, we like our gods to be controllable. We don't, we don't necessarily want a, a God that we can't control. Israel thought they could control God. Uh, for some reason, they mistook the Ark of the Covenant a box made of acacia wood, overlaid in gold, which was to be kept in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the holy place, to represent the God's presence with, was with his people in a peculiar kind of way, a specific kind of way, a powerful kind of way. Uh, but in their misconceptions and in the fact that they were all going their own way, thinking their own thoughts, they had misconstrued the omnipresence of God for the ark of God. In fact, in this chapter that Sarah read to us just a, a few moments ago, you'll notice the ark of God is mentioned several times, the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord. We saw it in last week's passage as well. The book is called 1 Samuel, but it's not really a book about Samuel, it's a book about God. It's not a book about the exploits of Samuel, although Samuel plays a, an important role in the book. It's a book about God. It's a book primarily about God. It's a book that focuses our attention on God. It's a book that wants us to behold our God. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago in the book of Judges, which is a, a time somewhat commensurate with what we're studying right now, the people of God were characterized as going their own way. Every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. They took God lightly. They domesticated their God. They weren't afraid of their God. They didn't have reverence and fear, an appropriate fear, an appropriate reverence for God. And yet when you read this chapter, it resonates with the idea you shouldn't take God lightly. He's heavy. He's serious. He's consequential. But he's good. The good news is he's good. That's the great news. He's kind. But don't push his buttons. And one of the buttons, if we're not careful, is treating him lightly. He won't be treated lightly. He, he won't be put side by side with other gods. I want you to think about the supremacy of God as we look at chapter 5. I want you to notice with me that the God of the Bible is the one and only God, and He crushes all other gods. In the opening two verses that were read to us just a few moments ago, uh, the people of God abandoned the ark of God. They abandoned it after having been thoroughly thrashed and defeated by the Philistines. They abandoned the ark of God at Ebenezer. Every man ran to his own home, to his own tent. And the Philistines took the ark of God from Ebenezer to Ashdod. About 25 or 30 miles southwest of Ebenezer is where Ashdod was located on the Palestinian uh, on the Mediterranean coast. The Philistines controlled five cities and their chief god, they were polytheistic, they had a multiplicity of gods, their chief god was Dagon. Dagon was half man, half fish. And so they take the ark of God, which was intended to represent the presence of God, it didn't contain God, but they took the ark of God and they put it into the shrine beside the image of Dagon. And you'll notice that in verse 1 and 2, the repetition of the idea of the ark of God, you'll notice the repetition of Dagon. 
the author's drawing a contrast. There's the Philistine God and there's Israel's God. There's the Philistines, Dagon, and there is the God of Israel. One God is alive, the other God is dead. God of Israel is alive, the God of the Philistines doesn't exist. Not only is he not dead, as I said, he doesn't exist. But the Philistines don't believe that, nor does Israel believe that. In fact, Israel believes that the God of Israel, their God, has been defeated by the Philistines, and the Philistines believe that as well. So they place it, notice, at the end of verse 2, beside Dagon, and placed it beside Dagon. The Ten Commandments say there is no God to be placed beside the one true and living God. To be placed beside God is to be equal to God. And yet that's exactly where they placed the Ark of the Covenant, beside Dagon. But Dagon probably stood above and looked down below as the little box, the Ark of the Covenant, was placed beside him. And then the oddest thing happened over the next two mornings. The next morning when they went to the shrine of Dagon, we find in verse 3 that Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. It must have been stunning. They walk, into the, they walk into the shrine, and there is Dagon stretched out before the ark of the Lord. And then they do the oddest thing. They've got to pick their God up. Their God has fallen down. So they pick up their God and, repl- and, re- and return him to his shrine. Well, the next day they go in. And you'll notice that Dagon has fallen again, and this time Dagon's head is broken off, and his hands have broken off, and and there he lay before the Ark of the Covenant, before the earthly manifestation of the presence of God. God is omnipresent. He wasn't contained in that box. He wasn't contained in that Ark, but that Ark represented his presence among his people, his power, his greatness, his glory, his grandeur. And there it lay before the ark. It sends panic and turmoil through Ashdod. They're concerned about the fact that the God of Israel, the God that they thought they had defeated, was defeating their God in the shrine of their God. And there he was on his face, his head broken off, his hands broken off, They've got to remove the Ark of the Covenant, and they do just that. They first move it to Ashdod. They move it to Ashdod, and then they move it to Gath, and then they move it to Ekron. And over the next several verses, 6, 7, and 8, everywhere the Ark goes, the Ark brings devastation and destruction. But it's not the Ark. They think it's the Ark, but it's God. God producing tumors as a sign of judgment. They recognize that this is comparable to what happened to the Egyptians. You remember when God struck the Egyptians with a series of plagues. Israel was not struck by the plagues. The Egyptians were struck by the plagues, by the power of God. God devastated the most powerful nation in the ancient world at that time, the Egyptians, brought them to their knees. And he sent the, he sent the Israelite people out free, having brought devastating plagues on the Egyptians. That's exactly what he does here. And you'll notice with me in verse 8, So they sent word and gathered all the governors of the Philistines to them. And said, what shall I do? What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Over and over the ark is mentioned. These chapters are about the ark of God as a manifestation of the powerful presence of God, but not containing God. What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they said, 
have the ark of God, the God of Israel, brought to Gath. So they took the God of the ark of the God of Israel away. And when they had taken it away, the hand of the Lord was against the city, creating a great panic. And he struck the people of the city from the young to the old, so that tumors broke out on them. It's interesting, it says from the young to the old. Consequences have choices, and parental consequences have monumental choices. Notice the children suffered at the hand of God's judgment, just like their parents suffered at the hands of God's judgment. Parental choices are monumentally important. Whether we recognize it or not, we are transmitting our beliefs about the world to our children by the choices that we make. They learn what's important to us by the decisions we make. They learn what's important to us by the, by the things that we say, the places we go, the activities we're engaged in. In many ways, we are crafting our children's future unbeknownst to them. I, I think, I, I'm so glad that, that we have Family Life Ministries coming to town and, and, uh, and Ryan, Pastor Ryan is taking, uh, gonna lead a group from our church to this. And you get 50% discount. I think Gabriel may or may not have mentioned that if you sign up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, your position may be, well, you know, we've got a very good marriage. Well, that's absolutely possible. I don't have any doubts about it. We have a lot of very good marriages. But you can take a very expensive car, and if you never give it a tune-up, eventually it begins to have problems. And, and eventually it can have major problems. It doesn't matter how expensive it is. It doesn't matter how well running it is today. If you don't give it regular maintenance, it catches up with the vehicle. I say all of that to come back to this. Parental choices have consequences. Uh, I've been at this now 40 years. You'd have thought, I'd have thought you'd been there 70 years doing it. No, 40 years been pastoring, teaching, professor, church staffs. I think there are more and more and more and more and more dysfunctional marriages from the get-go. From the get-go. Because they've never seen a good marriage, a healthy marriage. They've, they've never seen a sacrificial relationship of a mom and dad, loving, serving, caring for one another. And they grow up kind of thinking, well, you just say what you want to say, when you want to say it, how you want to say it to your spouse. And then they become spouses and they realize that don't work so well. Say, Pastor, how did you get off on that? Uh, right here, the tumors broke out on the children. God has constructed the atmosphere of the family and the culture of a society to have, the, have effects on everybody. That's why the decisions we make, if we're going to treat God lightly, inconsequentially, kind of as uh, however, it, however it comes, if he fits into our schedule, that's fantastic. If he doesn't, we'll get back to him in a couple of weeks. That's going to backfire on you, primarily on your children. And so they were suffering because, because they didn't respond appropriately to the presence of God. Think about it. For seven months, it says in the first verse, for seven months the ark of God was in the confines 
of the Phil Philistine nation. First in the shrine of Dagon and then passed along from city to city to try and get out from under its, its heavy hand. And seven months, they came to the conclusion, the God of Israel is superior to Dagon. The God of Israel is destroying us just like he did the Egyptians. The God of Israel is bringing tumors on us and our children. They knew the power of God, but they didn't know the love of God. They didn't love God. His presence and His power were there, but it didn't have any effect on them. The presence and the power of God was heavy among them, and the glory of God was weighing down on them, but it didn't change. It didn't change their opinion religiously at all. In fact, look with me in verse 11 and 12. Therefore, they sent word and gathered all the governors of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away and let it return to its own place so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly panic throughout the city and the hand of God was very heavy. And the people who did not die were struck with tumors. And the outcry of the city went up to heaven. And yet they didn't turn from their idolatry. You would have thought it would have shaken them into, into spiritual consciousness. That the God of Israel is greater than our God. But it's unbelievably difficult to break out of idolatry. But why do people worship idols in the first place? We've all been created by God to be worshipers. From the very beginning, we've been created by God to worship. And everyone finds somebody or something to worship. Someone or something. Why is that? Even in a secular society like we live, people have their idols. Uh, Tim Keller wrote a, wrote a book about this. He, he called it uh, Money, Sex, and Power. That's the, that's the idolatry of Western civilization outside the people of God. The insatiable longing for more money, more sex, and more power. And people will do essentially anything they can, and anything they will, to get more money, more sex, more power. Now, any of those things in the right confines under the Lordship of Jesus are, are, are gifts from God and, and uh, are blessings from God. Power, for instance, can be used to do so much good. But when power becomes about me, then you can tell it in the way that other people are treated. It's, it's true in the church. We've talked about this many, many times. One of the most unusual things is people start out wanting to love and serve God, and then as God blesses their ministry, it ends up about speaking demeaningly and depreciatorily and, and badly about those whom you work with or those who work for you. And, and we've seen many, many, many significant ministries collapse under the unbelievable weight of an insatiable longing for spiritual power over the lives of other people and having people serve them and their vision and their purpose and their, and their desires for ministry as if it were the only vision and purpose and desire for ministry. And then you, you look at the way that that some people in ministry live. Like the homes that some of them live in or like the kinds of homes that rock stars live in. And then it seems like, as we mentioned just the other week, that 
there are more ministers falling, falling to sexual sin than at any time in history. I don't think any of these are unique. I think the Internet allows us to find out about it more quickly. I think the Internet allows us to, to, uh, to, to read more about it more quickly. But I, I do think it's possible to become an idolater even while being a preacher. Why do people worship idols? Because we've been created to worship. And either we worship God, or we worship things, or we worship a person. It's going to be a battle our entire lives to keep it all in perspective. There, there's, the, there's the Philistine effect. The Philistine effect is we have indwelling sin and we're all prone toward idolatry. Uh, there, there's this predisposition toward it. it. It's the effects of Adam's sin. Adam wanted to be like God. He thought if he ate from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, he'd be like God. Uh, he, he did not become God. And there's, there's the Philistine effect of idolatry. It doesn't matter who we are or how far we make it in the Christian life. We've got to always be alert. We've got to always be focused. We can never get distracted because God wants us to worship Him and Him alone. And so why do we worship idols? Because we've been created to worship. Why does God hate idolatry? God hates idolatry because He created us to worship Him. He created us to serve Him. The glory belongs only to Him. God hates idolatry. God is jealous for our love and affection. He's a heavy God. He's an awesome God. He's a, he's a frightening God, but He's also good. And he doesn't want us to turn the blessings that he gives us into idols. He blesses us with every good thing that we have in life. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. There's nothing good I have that doesn't come from God. There's nothing good I do that isn't done by God through me. And the same is true for you. He gives us so many good things, so many wonderful gifts. He wants us to enjoy them but he wants us to see them in their proper place because God hates idolatry because he created us for himself. As the early church spread ever further out of Jerusalem into the Greco-Roman world over and over and over again, Paul encountered people who are idolaters. Uh, the same was true in the day of Samuel. Uh, we see it with the Philistines. What was true of the Philistines was true of all of the people that surrounded Israel. They were idolaters. Uh, John Stott had something to say about idolatry. Let me, let, me, let me read this to you. Because he says, It's difficult for us to understand how radical it is to change the allegiance of one relationship from idols to God. He compares idols and God in this way. Idols are dead. God is living. Idols are false. God is true. Idols are many. God is one. Idols are visible and tangible. God is invisible and intangible. Beyond the reach of sight and touch. Idols are creatures or creations, the work of human hands. God is the creator of the universe and of all humankind. You might think having read chapter 5 of 1 Samuel and hearing what I've had to say, God is dangerous. He really is dangerous. 
But like Mr. Beaver, he is good. As dangerous as he is and as unwilling as he is for us to domesticate him, he loves us. He loves you. He, he lets you pray to him. He doesn't want you to run from him. He wants you to run to him. He doesn't want you to worship idols. He wants you to worship him. He wants to bless your life. He wants to fill your life with joy. He wants to fill your life with his blessings. He wants you to know his care and his concern and his love for you. He's dangerous like a lion, as Mr. Beaver says, but he's good. You could try to hide from him. It didn't work so well for Adam. Remember, Adam tried to hide from God, but you can't hide from him. Let me just encourage you to run to him. Don't treat him superstitiously like he's contained to a box. Just remind yourself, everywhere you go, he's there. You think, that's kind of frightening. Well, maybe it is kind of frightening, but I think it's kind of good. I think it's really good. No matter what the circumstance or situation I may be in, he's there with me. No matter how heartbroken I may be, he's there with me. No matter how difficult a decision I'm in the process of making in the doing of good rather than wrong, he's there to help me. He's good. Dagon found that out. The Philistines found that out. Let's pray that the world can find it as well. I'm going to ask if you'll stand and let me lead us in a word of prayer. Aaron's going to come and lead us in a final song. As we're singing to the one true and living God, remember that uh, he's good. It may be that you'd like to speak to someone after the service. The folks that work at our connection centers, they can talk to you. They can pray for you. And they're ready to minister to you if you need to be ministered to today. I'm going to ask if you'll pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for 1 Samuel chapter 5. The Father was written so long ago. And yet it's, it is stunningly relevant today. Father, we recognize we don't worship any Dagons. But if we're not careful, we can worship the blessings that you've blessed us with. Thank you that you're good and kind and you point that out to us. And Father, if there are things in our lives, even now, that we're worshiping, maybe it's heartache and disappointment or blessings and riches. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as we sing this final song, as we hear it sung, that the Spirit would fill us more and more with his presence and our attention, our affections, our passions would be turned toward the one true and living God who is not only good, but who is also kind and patient and loving and forgiving and forbearing with his people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.